sorry for starting a little late. Uh, good evening all to the 126th session of the weekly huddle. I'm your host Anoop and joining me today is my friend and co-host uh, Praneet. We both are cardiologists working at Kim's Hospital. Uh, in today's discussion where we are going to talk about uh, herpes zoster, and we'll talk about uh, the various aspects of diagnosis, treatment, uh, and a little bit emphasis on uh, the vaccine. And uh, to help me with the discussion, I am joined by Dr. Pratik. He is an infectious disease specialist at Kim's Hospital. And I'm hoping that at some point, I will also be joined by Dr. Anand, who is uh, uh, a dermatologist uh, at Kim's Hospital as well. So I will start with a case, and uh, as it has been a custom at the weekly huddle, I always ask uh, uh, Praneet to give his initial impression, and then uh, we will take comments from uh, the attendees. So this is a 64-year-old male who has a history of diabetes uh, for uh, almost 10 years now, uh, which is reasonably controlled, also has hypertension for around the same duration, he is a reformed smoker. He used to smoke uh, up until 10 years back when actually it all started with uh, uh, him uh, being diagnosed with diabetes at the time. And since then, uh, he kind of got his uh, life in shape. Very recently, he was uh, admitted to the hospital for unstable angina. That was about six months back uh, where an angiogram was done and uh, a significant stenosis was found in his uh, left anterior descending artery. He underwent angioplasty uh, for that, which was uh, uncomplicated. So that, that happened around six months back. We saw him three months ago. At that time, he was doing okay. His uh, diabetes and hypertension, as I said, was, were reasonably controlled. This time, he actually messaged me first saying that, Doc, I'm having uh, left-sided chest pain for about uh, four days now, three to four days now. Uh, and uh, while uh, over the phone, it was very difficult to differentiate the characteristics of the chest pain because of his uh, recent history of uh, unstable angina and an angioplasty about six months back, I told him to come to my clinic for further evaluation. And uh, in the clinic, uh, it was quite obvious that his chest pain was uh, non-cardiac in nature. Uh, I'll directly go through the examination finding, which uh, to me, to a cardiologist's eye, it looked like uh, a zoster rash, which essentially for me is a erythematous base and over which there were few vesicular eruptions. They were patchy in location, but uh, it was it was uh, relatively easy for me to track it down that they were following a particular dermatome. They seemed to be very early onset because there were very few um, vesicles that I could identify. So uh, I made a working diagnosis of herpetic eruptions, and uh, I decided to refer this patient to, to infectious disease to uh, decide further. Uh, uh, treatment strategy and management. Now, this patient has not taken any adult vaccine, at least not that he can remember, and he can't recollect his childhood vaccines, uh, which uh, he can conclusively say that he was vaccinated for. His rest of the physical examination was within normal limits, and he did not have any other obvious symptoms that uh, is worth mentioning. There were no routine, routine labs ordered for this visit because last time when he came around two, two and a half months back, a detailed assessment was done, which was within normal limits. So with this background, I want to discuss a few things uh, uh, about uh, the zoster uh, diagnosis and treatment. Number one, are there any diagnostics which uh, needs to be done in this particular patient before we make the diagnosis of herpes zoster? Uh, what would be the appropriate treatment strategy for this patient? Uh, how can we counsel this patient to uh, prevent uh, for the community spread? And uh, is there a role of treating, is there a role of vaccine in treating this index episode or to uh, prevent future episodes, particularly a uh, role of um, preventing uh, uh, post herpetic uh, neuralgias? And uh, as a general, uh, can we advocate uh, shingles vaccine in all comers beyond a certain age? So those are some of my uh, discussion points. And uh, I actually was hoping uh, to have a dermatologist here. So far, he has not joined uh, because 
because this being a more dermatological diagnosis, I wanted to get a little bit of impression about how dermatologists think whenever they see vesicular rash. Uh, during during our MBBS, we we uh, our dermatology or at least my dermatology faculty, he tried to teach me. He tried a lot to make me differentiate between one skin lesions and another, and uh, I failed miserably. So. Uh, maybe this was my this would have been my second attempt to understand some of the skin lesions. But uh, having said that, let us continue with this discussion. I will stick myself to my expertise, uh, but uh, we are all here to learn a little bit. So, Praneet, if this patient were to come to you, uh, are you are you convinced with my diagnosis, or do you want to do something else? Do you treat zoster by yourself? How comfortable you feel? Or would you be sending all the patients for infectious disease? And lastly, have you recommended uh, shingles vaccine to any of your patients? Right. Yeah. So, uh, so this patient, the way you described, I believe if somebody has uh, previously seen a zoster rash, uh, I think that is uh, that uh, experience itself will be confident enough for you to make a diagnosis. The characteristic. Uh, Finding being dermatomal uh, distribution, the, the so-called classic unilateral description where the rash does not cross midline or it follows a particular dermatome. Now, uh, if, we are, if we have read our anatomy well, we know about dermatomal distribution. So if you can uh, follow that dermatome, where is the dermatomal distribution? And if that rash follows that particular dermatome, and I believe that uh, to make a diagnosis of a zoster rash, I think it's a clinical diagnosis. In my opinion, uh, that uh, the description of the rash itself uh, is uh, sufficient to make a diagnosis. Any other investigations, I'm not aware of. And uh, so far, I haven't ordered any. And equally, I'm not aware of what investigations to order. Once uh, a diagnosis of uh, zoster is made, the most important thing is to... Uh, know at what stage they are, the way you are describing, it is an active infection that the patient is having and hopefully and probably the patient is equally having pain. So the patient needs help. So it, uh, it is a flare of the uh, infection because of uh, reduction in immunity due to a, any reason. Uh, so you have to give antiviral uh, course, acyclovir or gancyclovir is the uh, drug of choice in my opinion. And uh, am I comfortable in giving uh, these drugs? No, because uh, because of the close proximity of uh, working with uh, dermatologists uh, or the so-called infectious disease specialist. I'm, I did not have to put my head into uh, making a diagnosis. So the moment I make a diagnosis, I would refer either to a dermatologist or an infectious disease specialist. Uh, regarding um, vaccination, I haven't uh prescribed anybody i also my knowledge in relation to adult vaccination particularly zoster is limited and i'm here to learn about the role of vaccination to prevent these Anup. thank you praneet uh in fact that zoster vaccine story haunts me a lot because uh or shingles vaccine i would say because it was part of uh, the quality control that uh, uh, U.S. tracks for each of the physicians. So if you are an internist or if you are a cardiologist, it doesn't matter if your patient. So it's a quality matrix. If you have a certain proportion of patients who are not vaccinated for shingles, then uh, the medical system will ding you for being inefficient or, uh, or not doing your job properly. But I agree with you. Uh, I have also not ordered a shingles vaccine in India. I hope that it is available. It is just that it doesn't trigger in our regular day-to-day -day practice. Uh, we have Shankar sir here. Shankar sir, I'm sure that you can throw far more uh, light on this topic than what we can uh, blabber about. So if you could just walk us through particular this case, uh, is uh, are we still uh, are we still diagnosing uh, clinically, or are there any skin smears or anything that we are doing? And uh, tell us about uh, the vaccine part, the treatment. I think Pratik sir is here, so he can walk us through uh, the treatment aspect uh, altogether. 
But Shankar sir, tell us your story about how frequently you see zoster and how do you handle it? Uh, good evening to all. <clears throat> uh, this is a quite common uh, uh, condition we see in our day-to-day -day practice, especially in the elderly individuals, uh, in the diabetic population and immunosuppressed individuals like uh, HIV, those who are on uh, uh, steroid therapy, uh, glucocorticoids, uh, then uh, any immunosuppressive therapy like cytotoxic agents and all. So this is a quite uh, common uh, presentation. And uh, if you see the statistics, uh, 25 to 30 percent of the population, they suffer uh, this herpes zoster in their lifetime. So this is a statistical evidence. So. Um, it may be noticed, it may be sometimes, uh, it may be unnoticed. So it is a clinical diagnosis. The herpes zoster is a clinical diagnosis and uh, the vesicular uh, first uh, the prodrome will be there. The, the pain in the form of uh, burning or stabbing type of pain uh, before the rash appears. Uh, after two to, uh, two to three days, the rash appears, erythematous papules and they become vesicles, then uh, they become uh, pustules and uh, ultimately they crust out uh, uh, in uh, seven to 10 days. So this is, uh, it is in a dermatomal fashion most of the times as uh, Dr. Pranit uh, alluded to. So sometimes uh, contiguous uh, dermatomes may be involved one or two. So if it is a multi-dermatomal, then we should think of uh, immuno uh, compromised patients uh, like uh, HIV and all. So this is purely a clinical diagnosis, but sometimes uh, the, the atypical presentation may be there in the, in, uh, in the presence of viremia, the herpes zoster, not only confined to the, the dermatomal fashion, but sometimes uh, the vesicular lesions may be scattered over. So that is uh, a disseminated herpes zoster sometimes we call it. So, and uh, one more condition, the other, so, so many conditions are there mimicking uh, this uh, uh, herpes zoster like lesions, uh, the blisters uh, forming lesions are there. So many are there, but uh, purely sometimes we get confused with uh, zostery form herpes simplex. That is uh, the herpes simplex we see the fever blisters. They may be seen on the buttocks or in the genitalia, uh, so or the face or trunk. So uh, they mimic uh, the herpes zoster lesions. So uh, this is uh, a zoster form uh, herpes simplex, and sometimes the contact dermatitis some uh, also produces uh, these vesicles or the blisters, bullae uh, or all. So in that situation only, whether and one more condition, the pain, pain will be there, that is a prodromata, but the rash may not appear. It is very difficult to diagnose in those situations. So, so in those situations, to arrive at a diagnosis of whether it is a uh, herpes zoster or not, the virus zoster virus, we have to, so polymerase chain reaction, that is a PCR, we go for that. But I have not so far ordered, uh, I have not come across any difficulty in diagnosing herpes zoster. Uh, even, uh, even any stage of development of herpes zoster uh, with uh, suspicious, uh, uh, we can diagnose uh, this herpes zoster. So there is uh, no difficulty in diagnosing uh, because uh, uh, a typical uh, presentation will be there in the dermatomal fashion. And especially uh, over the face, the, over the trunk. Uh, so from especially from T3 to uh, L3 segments will be involved. And uh, that is uncomplicated uh, herpes zoster. And complicated herpes zoster is, I uh, uh, will come across, I will tell you later, the diagnosis part. So it is a purely a clinical diagnosis because unilateral painful vesicular eruption in a dermatological distribution, there is no 
uh, difficulty in diagnosis. But the only the situations what I mentioned in the form of uh, this adjustment form herpes simplex and the contact dermatitis or where uh, the uh, joster sign herpety, that is pain without rash. In those situations, whether it is a herpes joster or not, we go for investigations like polymerase chain reaction PCR. Uh, and second is a direct fluorescent antibody test, DFA. Uh, and third one is a viral culture. These tests, the DFA or PCR or viral culture, so far in my four decades of practice, I have never ordered. And uh, there won't be any, see, in the situations like uh, difficult situations where confusing with the herpes zoster diagnosis, there we can order these investigations and uh, we can arrive at a uh, right diagnosis. And, uh, regarding uh, uh, the uncomplicated herpes zoster, uh, rash and uh, acute neuritis will be there. And in the complicated uh, uh, herpes zoster, we see post herpetic neuralgia and the herpes zoster ophthalmicus and acute retinal necrosis, Ramsey Hunt syndrome, that is the herpes zoster oticus, where uh, the, the vesicle eruption will be there on the uh, ear and auditory canal, and the patient will complain of uh, ear pain, and sometimes uh, the hearing uh, disturbances, hyperacusis or deafness. Uh, the vertigo, all these uh, associated with the ipsilateral facial palsy. So facial paralysis and uh, ear pain and uh, these vesicular eruptions are there. We say that uh, this is a epigoster verticus, otherwise known as a Ramsey Hunt syndrome, uh, where the seventh nerve and uh, the eighth nerve, sometimes the fifth and the ninth and tenth nerves may be involved associated. So then other uh, complications, very rare complications I have not come across. Uh, they are uh, uh, encephalitis, many aseptic meningitis, transverse myelitis, gulenbari like syndrome, and uh, stroke syndrome. So, so many other uh, very rare uh, conditions will be there where we say that it's a complicated herpes zoster. So, herpes zoster is a clinical diagnosis. Rarely we need uh, laboratory diagnosis uh, with the PCR and the FDA, uh, DFA and viral culture and uh, complicated and uncomplicated. One uh, point I would like to tell, uh, this is a Hutchinson sign where the vesicular eruption seen on the tip of the nose or the side of the nose or inner angle of the eye or root of the nose, if, if these vesicles are seen, it is, we should be very careful we should, uh, it will prompt a diagnosis of uh, there is a sight threatening condition. So immediately we should uh, respond to this and we should treat uh, this condition, herpes zoster ophthalmicus. Otherwise, there will be potential visual loss will be there. So with this uh, introduction regarding uh, herpes zoster, the clinical diagnosis with the rash and acute neuritis, and uh, complications and uncomplicated and uh, laboratory diagnosis. And the uh, uh, rest of the speakers, uh, I listen to them. Sir, tell me about vaccine in your practice. Uh, is it available or uh, have you prescribed? What is your experience? See, till recent times, there were no vaccines in India to combat uh, uh, this herpes zoster. There are two vaccines are there. One vaccine that is a, uh, a prime vaccine that is an essential vaccine is uh, the Shingrix. As you told, the Shingrix, this is a recombinant zoster va virus vaccine. It is not available in India now. It will be, shortly it will be made available by GSK laboratories. But uh, at present, recently, one vaccine is introduced into the market that is an older vaccine actually. Uh, that is uh, Josta Vax. That is uh, introduced in India. So the available vaccine in India is a Josta Vax. Uh, that is uh, a single dose. 
we give uh, uh, um, people uh, more elderly people more than 60 years and uh, more uh, we give immunocompetent people we give this vaccine but uh, really saying the shingrix is the best vaccine uh, it scores over the the old live attenuated uh, this jostavax virus vaccine uh, that is a rzv uh, that is a recombinant jostavirus vaccine shingrix uh, it is not available in india but uh, it will be shortly it will be available it is uh, it is given uh, two two, do two doses we should give uh, minimum four weeks apart uh, but contraindications are immunocompromised patients uh, we should be careful regarding uh, these vaccines in immunocompetent people elderly people uh, we can give uh, in uh, pregnancy during pregnancy also these vaccines uh, are contraindicated uh, Dr. Pratik will enlighten more uh, regarding uh, the, uh, these vaccines. Thank you so much, uh, Shankar, sir. So, uh, Pratik, sir, you probably got the background. You got uh, our understanding of the disease. You got the questions that we are trying to address in uh, this discussion. Some of that has already been answered by Praneet and uh, Dr. Shankar. Uh, I want your particular uh, expertise on uh, the diagnosis part of it. Uh, are there tests that we are doing yeah. or, or most of the time you can simply just look it and tell? And uh, please tell us, are we still at acyclovir or we have moved on to uh, valgan cyclovir or other cyclovirs and uh, your thought on vaccine? Pratik, sir. Yeah. Okay, thank you. See, uh, as far as the diagnosis goes, it's mostly the clinical diagnosis uh, most often it is very clear cut that it's a herpes zoster very uncommon times or very few times we, uh, the lesions are atypical in those cases maybe we can order the pcr from the fluid that's one second thing is we can get a scrapings and send it for the histopathology to look for any cytopathological changes which are classic for varicella so these are the two things uh, the uh, viral culture is not available in most of the cases or even let's say the PCR uh, we can send it it is available but not easily available and we don't often send it because most of the times it's clear cut diagnosis so that is one thing about the diagnosis now uh, just before we go for a diagnosis few things which I would wanted to add to the symptomatology See, in the zoster the main problem is not vesicles Obviously, they come a few days after the initial pain, but it's the herpetic or post-herpetic neuralgia that is the main uh, problem for the patients because it may last for a long time, maybe a few weeks, sometimes months. So that is the main problem because you have you the blisters come and then they disappear in a matter of a week or probably two weeks max. So and then they heal uh, appropriately most often, sometimes get secondary infection, but they heal without leaving much problem. It leaves a local pigmentation. Uh, so you can see that in many patients who had zoster in the past, uh, you can easily identify. I keep looking for it in patients who have HIV because it's one of the subtle markers. Sometimes you may have to consider whether the there is underlying HIV in some cases where there, there is no traditional risk factor for the zoster. So whenever there is a patient of possible HIV, I look at it as a zoster marks as a, one of the signs that there is a higher probability of HIV being underlying cause. So that is the main trouble. So uh, now coming to the treatment part, how do we approach the treatment? See, antivirals are easy to administer. Right now, there are two drugs that are available. It's acyclovir and val acyclovir. I think you probably uh, wrongly mentioned val gancyclovir, which is not used because it's commonly used for CMV re infection. It's not that. It's a val acyclovir. Again, it's a prodrug which gets converted. The ease of administration is there because it's only thrice daily, one tablet. 
However, acyclovir, the number of, I mean, you need to give it five times a day, uh, up to 800 milligrams per uh, dose is the dosage. So there is uh, more convenience with valacyclovir, uh, which is the uh, preferable treatment. Uh, there is another drug called famacyclovir, which is not available in India. So that's about the antivirals options, treat, uh, drugs available. Uh, now, which one, which patient needs treatment or uh, who is going to benefit with the antivirals? The best result with the antivirals can be achieved if it is started within 72 hours of uh, appearance of rash. So if you are having a presentation or uh, you are seeing the patient post 72 hours, probably it is not going to change the course of the disease. How does it help? Obviously, herpes zoster is a disease which doesn't cause morbidity. Sorry, it doesn't cause mortality, but it causes the uh, uh, blisters and pain. So it does uh, the treatment. Uh, it reduces the extent of the disease. The uh, healing is faster and it reduces to certain extent post-herpetic neuralgia. So that is how the treatment helps. It doesn't prevent spread. Uh, it doesn't... Uh, uh, prevent uh, the complications uh, in general. So that is about the uh, treatment, when to initiate. If it is within 72 hours, definitely yes. Second thing, in patients who are immunocompromised, in those cases, we need to give that. Third thing, when uh, there is an ocular uh, herpes zoster, if there is a ophthalmicus, uh, ophthalmic division involvement, or when you see the corneal ulcers, that is another situation where the treatment is warranted because it may leave the permanent damage on cornea, which we don't want. So that is another indication where the treatment is definitely indicated in otherwise healthy host. And if you are seeing more than 72 hours later, then probably you can just leave it alone and it will improve. But in those situations, pain management is the key because they are going to suffer a lot with the pain so we have to, and the, uh, the gabapentin and pregabalin, these are the two drugs which help a lot in treating the pain. And then after that, you can add uh, another drug like nortriptyline or amitriptyline in combination. If there is, a, uh, there is no, no relief with uh, appropriate dosage of these uh, gabapentin and pregabalin. So that is the important aspect, the post-herpetic neuralgia that is the main cumbersome uh, or the main uh, discomfort for the patient. Now, coming to the vaccines, like Shankar sir had already pointed out the uh, vaccines, uh, GSK is going to launch the recombinant vaccine. It's not a live vaccine. So uh, it can be used in even in uh, immunocompromised hosts and pregnant women. Uh, it is contraindicated if somebody has a history of hypersensitivity like anaphylaxis in the past. Uh, with these vaccines. So that's the only contraindication. Otherwise, if uh, you have an indi indication, which is classically anybody above 50 or uh, anybody above 18 with immunocompromising conditions, these are the classical indications for administration of herpes zoster vaccines. Uh, coming uh, again, it will be two doses, at least four weeks apart. But uh, the major hindrance which we are going to face even when the vaccine is launched, is the cost. Because uh, uh, the cost is, which I have spoken to the company since they told me that launching, and just out of interest, I asked, it's going to cost nearly 25,000 rupees for two dosages. So that is my main point. So you are uh, this is a disease which is not, uh, life-threatening or very severe disease. It's only the pain that is the major concern. And I really don't know yet how many people will be agreeing to take a vaccine which is this costly. So I think that will be a major challenge going forward. So yeah, that's my input uh, on this. Uh, if we have any other further discussions, others can please contribute or uh, add some comments. So, Pratik sir, thank you for that. I I have a lot of questions uh, following up with your uh, initial uh, thoughts, but I also uh, invite my attendees. If any of you have got any questions for Pratik sir, you can either raise your hand or put it up in the chat box, and uh, I will be happy to discuss those those questions as well. 
so Pratik sir, I will actually start from vaccine first, then we can uh, uh, track our way back. 25,000 rupees for a modern vaccine. Why yep. not use Zostavax? Why not use Zostavax in our patients? Uh, it's uh, yeah, it's a uh, good uh, reasonable alternative, but uh, efficacy is definitely better, and uh, the zero conversion or the protection is definitely better with this vaccine. So um, I was not aware that there is a Zostavax available. I have not used it so far. I was actually uh, waiting for this vaccine. I had a few patients, obviously, who I was thinking of uh, suggesting the vaccine when it's due. But I have not used the other vaccine, so I'm not sure how much it costs. And then the second question is, uh, when I'm when I'm asking a patient to spend twenty five thousand rupees for a vaccine, what 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 is the aim of this vaccine? Is it to prevent future zoster episodes? Is it to prevent post herpetic neuralgia? Is it going to help with the index infection? To heal better, what is the what is the overall role of the vaccine? So the vaccine will prevent the uh, herpes zoster in future and, and the herpes post herpetic neuralgia. However, if somebody has already got the herpes zoster or currently having a herpes zoster, probably it's not going to be of any use. So the vaccine doesn't reduce the severity or the extent of the disease in the ongoing infection. So it's only for the subsequent infections. Again, if you had a zoster, probably again, how much it will benefit, we don't know. So that is the main problem in this case. So probably the patients uh, who have had herpes zoster, they will understand how important this vaccine is because the pain is really bad pain. They suffer a lot. And they may understand the uh, value of this vaccine. However, once you get a zoster, you usually don't get it again. So probably the best target in such situations, what my thought was, the family members of the affected patients. So if you have close family relatives who, are, uh, who have seen their uh, family members affected and suffering with this, they will be my uh, probable best patients who are likely to accept the vaccine if they have uh, indication to take the vaccine. Now, talking about family members, when when we get a patient with uh, a vesicular rash, uh, are there any uh, containment strategies that we need to do? Are there any isolation strategies we need to do or uh, it doesn't spread because it's in reactivation? What is your thought on this? No, it definitely spreads, but it's not like a chickenpox or a primary varicella where there is a disseminated rash. So whenever you have a patient who has a herpes zoster, the only thing that you need to do is cover the area which has the vesicles. That's it. That's the only infection control measure that we need to take. And those who are handling it, dressing it, that's it. That's the only exposure. Other than that, the normal... Uh, varicella, the generalized varicella, it spreads by the uh, airborne route. So you really don't need to come in direct contact to get a chicken pox if you get exposed to somebody. I think, sir, you got muted, huh? Sorry. Sorry, I got a call. That's why I probably got disconnected. Yes. Mm -hmm. So uh, the chicken pox, the primary varicella is airborne. So you uh, don't need a direct contact to acquire the infection if it's a close proximity or if it's in the same room or something you can still get it so for the virus is for zoster it's just a close contact or direct contact that is the risk involved uh, otherwise i don't think there is anything that needs to be done so in case if you have a family member who has a zoster if in that case cover that area if you have anybody immunocompromised person in the family, keep them away. That's what I'm, I would suggest. So as a healthcare personnel, when I'm examining, I should be gloved up, right? Yes. Okay. Uh, there is one question which has come up is that people who received chickenpox vaccine during childhood, do they need shingles vaccine or they are done? They don't need any no, more shingles vaccine? They need it. They need it. They See, need it. Uh, yes. So uh, prior... Uh, history of chickenpox per se, or primary vaccination with chickenpox vaccine is not a reason not to give the vaccine. You still need to give advice chickenpox, uh, sorry, the zoster vaccine if they have an appropriate 
indication. So anybody above 50 or above 18 with risk factors, you can give that one as well. Now, talking about the treatment part, which I got the questions. And again, if any of the attendees have any questions, they can also post. You said well a cyclovir, not valgan cyclovir. Are we are we getting confused? Those are two different antivirals. Is that right? Yes. Yes, that's right. Valgan cyclovir and GAN cyclovir are used for the CMV infections. And acyclovir and valacyclovir are used for the uh, uh, all these uh, other herpes group of infections, which are basically the HSV1, HSV2, uh, varicella virus, which is HSV6. I see. And uh, last two or three questions. When there is there is this because this chicken pox, small pox, they are all so old diseases. They are. They are there for quite some time. Uh, everybody in the community knows about it. And uh, I'm sure each community has their way of dealing with this uh, infection. And as you mentioned, pain is the main problem. Have you come across any uh, substantial data to support home remedies which can help with uh, pain control better? Uh, not really. Not really. And uh, any topical preparation which can help uh, eradicate the infection better or earlier or the pain control? Any topical measure? Uh, I don't see there is a good uh, uh, data or a strong data to say that topical. You see, there are creams of uh, acyclovir available, topical creams, which can be applied. But uh, uh, again, they are not very useful. Perfect. Those were the questions, sir, that I have gathered as you were uh, summarizing your thoughts. If anyone has any other questions, yeah, Praneet, you have something? Duration of antiviral therapy. Sir, duration? Yes, seven, days. Five to seven, days. seven days. Seven days. Okay. Shankar, sir, any questions from your side? Uh, regarding, uh, you asked about the two vaccines. The Josta virus vaccine is in the older version. Actually, it is available in India uh, by, it is manufactured by MSD uh, company. Uh, it is around uh, 6,000, I think. But uh, so far, I have not used, uh, to be frank. Uh, but it is available. Uh, but okay. uh, totally, we are getting Shingrix. That is a, yes. a new version, uh, uh, recombinant Josta virus vaccine. Uh, this uh, Josta virus, Josta vaccine is, live attenuated uh, vaccine, uh, it gives uh, protection again is the herpes zoster uh, to the tune of uh, only 33 to uh, 55 percent. This is the uh, company's uh, uh, claiming. Uh, and it also reduces the incidence of post herpetic neuralgia to the extent of 55 to 67 uh, percent. But uh, the recombinant Zosta uh, virus vaccine, which is going to come to the market, uh, that uh, gives a protection to the extent of 97%. The Zosta vax virus uh, vaccine gives only protection for three years only, uh, maximum. But uh, this uh, recombinant Zosta virus RZV vaccine, Shingrix, uh, gives a protection to the extent of 10, more than 10 years. So this is, uh, RZV is an ideal one uh, um, regarding the protection. And also the beauty of these vaccines is uh, they reduces the incidence of post herpetic neuralgia also. The, the of all uh, the discussion regarding the herpes zoster is pain, uh, as the Dr. Pratik uh, already alluded to. So pain, uh, it is in the, uh, you know, the almost three forms, three phases. One is acute neuritis at the time of rash. And second, that, la that may last uh, for 30 days. Uh, that uh, acute neuritis uh, type of uh, herpetic neuralgia. Then comes the subacute uh, herpetic neuralgia that is uh, less than 90 days, 30 days to 90 days. The post herpetic neuralgia will be, we say that it is post-herpetic neuralgia uh, beyond 90 days. That is beyond three months, the pain is persistent. Then we say that it is a post-herpetic neuralgia. So where we see 
we don't see the crust or vesicles or pustules or anything. We see the scarring and sometimes hyperpigmentation or hypopigmentation at that side. Patient, uh, patient will have uh, uh, horrible pain. He, they won't tolerate the elderly people. They won't tolerate. That's why these vaccines are essential in the adult vaccination uh, schedule. Uh, this is regarding the vaccines. And shortly, we are getting this shingrix. Uh, and coming to the this uh, treatment point, uh, Dr. Pratik has already alluded to regarding uh, uh, the acyclovir, which has to be given 800 milligrams for five times daily. Uh, so for every four hours. So then uh, the valacyclovir, 1000 milligrams, three times daily for seven days. And one more drug is also there in the market now. It is also equally efficacious, that is the famcyclovir. Uh, that is freely available, but uh, compared to valcyclovir, the famcyclovir is a uh, little cheaper. Uh, but uh, compared to valcyclovir, uh, both uh, drugs, valcyclovir and the famcyclovir, are costlier. But uh, amongst the valcyclovir and the famcyclovir, famcyclovir is a little cheaper because I am using uh, this famcyclovir uh, and valcyclovir also. Uh, only thing is uh, the difference uh, is, is uh, frequent dosing schedule is there where the adherence of the compliance uh, with the drug is a little poor. Uh, but whereas uh, this valacyclovir or the famcyclovir, famcyclovir 500 milligrams three times daily for seven days. Valacyclovir is one gram thrice daily for seven days. So this is the three times daily only. And one more drug, it is it has not come into the market, but it is available in Japan, uh, approved in Japan. That is amenamivir, uh, amenamivir, amenamivir. That is a single dose. Uh, so oh, it is still not available anywhere in the world except in Japan. So, so the, if it is made available, we don't know the cost, but uh, if it is made available that will be a, a laudable one. And uh, coming to this pain management, uh, uh, I personally, in my practice, uh, I use uh, prednisolone, especially in elderly people, immunocompetent, where the, uh, there is no immunocompromised status, uh, states like uh, HIV, cancer, malignancy, or uh, immunosuppressive therapy, or any uh, transplant patients. I don't give. But uh, uh, even in diabetes also, in diabetes and hypertension also, I don't have drugs. But immunocompetent individuals and uh, elderly people, where we can uh, reduce the... Uh, still, though it is uh, still controversial, but uh, I uh, administer uh, this prednisolone uh, tapering schedule. Oh, 60 milligrams for one first week and 30 milligrams for second week and 15 milligrams for third week I give. And uh, I've seen in my clinical practice, the patient feels better. The lesions also, they uh, heal faster and uh, the severity and uh, the duration also will be shortened and the pain also will be reduced uh, with this uh, introduction of uh, this prednisolone. But the prednisolone has to be given along with the antiviral therapy. Uh, under the coverage of antiviral therapy only, we should give a prednisolone. Otherwise, we should not give uh, patient, uh, the lesions may be flared up or they, there may be secondary bacterial infection we come across. So, uh, this is my opinion, but what uh, Pratik's opinion, I don't know. Uh, what uh, other dermatologists, so how they practice, I don't know. But uh, uh, oh, over the four decades of my practice, I, uh, I used to give, I give also uh, this prednisolone for the three-week period, uh, tapering schedule. And I have seen uh, good results with this prednisolone. Uh, those who have, give, who have been given uh, prednisolone, they experience post herpetic neuralgia less in my clinical practice. Thank you, sir. Uh, 
Rukmini, ma'am, I want to read your comment, but I'm but I am requesting you if you could unmute yourself and share your thoughts about uh, pain control uh, in uh, Zoster. Rukmini, ma'am. Hi, sorry. Uh, good evening. That's that's a really nice uh, talk. So, Zoster, we see a lot of post herpetic neuralgia. Yeah? Not as much as the probably the rest of the world because the prevalence is supposed to be quite high. Um, one in three people are supposed to, one in three or one in five are supposed to develop it. But we don't see it so often. But yeah, once the, uh, as uh, Dr. Shankar has said very clearly, that if it initial treatment options, acute pain can be actually managed well with steroids. If it start, lasts for more than three months, it becomes a little refractory to treatment. So sometimes we give everything. I mean, we give gabapentin, we give uh, not triptylin, we uh, give carbamazepine, ox carbamazepine, sometimes a nerve block, which is given temporarily at least to relieve the pain. We have given botulinum toxin also for uh, this painful syndrome. And sometimes, I mean, it can be quite refractory. People have had pain for almost, I mean, you know, like they've been having it for five to six years and they need the combination of all of these medications to keep them pain free or at least to a tolerable amount of pain. So some, the pain can be quite severe and it can be quite disabling. I think that's the uh, reason why the vaccine is probably, I mean, probably useful. I haven't, I haven't actually prescribed any patient vaccine because we see them later on. The other thing that we see with herpes zoster is our herpes zoster uh, transverse myelitis, where sometimes it's a little difficult to know whether it's a uh, immune mediated transverse myelitis or a herpes, herpes, herpes zoster transverse myelitis. And sometimes we may not have a rash with the zoster. So the patient has got a febrile illness. Now this is like the common uh, norm almost, like almost all the patients we send herpes zoster antibodies in the CSF and in the serum. If it's elevated in the serum, I mean in the CSF, we treat with acyclovir along with uh, steroids. Most of the patients have a rash either preceding or following the transverse myelitis, but sometimes you may just have the transverse myelitis. So, I mean, this is my experience. We haven't seen very many patients, probably I would have seen uh, maybe around 20 odd patients in the last uh, 12 years. Thank you so much, ma'am. Uh, Pratik, sir, so this steroid business, is it, do you validate that? Are there schools of thought that it works? What is your thought on this? Uh, see, steroid, they have been used, but again, the data is not very strong regarding the uh, benefit of steroids. Again, I mean, you can use it along with the antivirals. I have not used it much. I use it only in cases, uh, uh, probably it's refractory or not improving the uh, pain with the other medications. So that's where I use it. Obviously, if you have a transverse myelitis, you need to use that. But uh, if there is only a uh, skin rash with uh, uh, pain, I usually don't use it. And then, you know, I am uh, recollecting your initial comment uh, that you had about this case. You mentioned about using antivirals, the most effectivity in the first 72 hours. Now, yeah. In the first 72 hours, we rarely see any vesicles or anything. So isn't that a little counterintuitive where the diagnosis is difficult and then empirically you start therapy or uh, you do see the telltale sign of zoster in those cases? No, no, no. it's the uh, first 72 hours uh, of rash. Okay, I see. First 72 hours of rash. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Not the first so 72 that's hours how of pain. It... Because Right, because many of the yeah, pain because pain. you hardly get any rash in first seventy-two hours of pain. Right, right, right. So it is the first seventy-two hours of the rash onset that you are talking. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Perfect. Perfect. Uh, if there are any more questions, maybe you can put it up in the chat box. And uh, at this time, I will ask uh, Somaradu sir for his comments. Uh, I I understand, sir, you joined a little late, uh, but uh, you heard most of the discussion that happened. Uh, any suggestions or any questions from your side? Uh, thank you, Anu and uh, uh, Pranit and uh, uh, all of you. And uh, I learned uh, a few things uh, while listening to uh, many of you. And uh, 
this is a very uh, uh, say healthy job study is a uh, teacher's humility to cardiologists. They have they come with chest pain and then they suggest an angiogram only to realize later that uh, it all was HP Joster. It happens to, uh, more than once to a lot of cardiologists and uh, so it teaches us some lessons. Having said that, I just wanted to know, I joined late. If uh, uh, so it discussed already, ignore it. But LP Joster and uh, uh, a presentation of a temporal arthritis like syndrome, which is a very dangerous situation. Can anyone enlighten on it? Sir, we did not discuss on this. Uh... Pratik, sir, are you the right person for me to ask this question? Herpes zoster presenting as temporal arthritis. Uh, I have not seen any case and uh, probably it's not a very common uh, uh, presentation, but can cause, but uh, I haven't seen any case about it. The, the issue is not commonness. Uh, it is the dangerousness of the situation. Uh, recognition early uh, is extremely important in this situation. You should keep that in mind. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, sir. So, Samaradu, sir, does it actually cause vasculitis or it actually is causing neuritis, but it is mimicking as a, mimicking as a vasculitis? It mimics and uh, almost resembles it. I almost don't have... resembles it. Yeah. Uh, you should keep that in mind. I see. So, I'm Thanks. guessing that when that kind of neuritis is present, then it will be automatic to put them on uh, antivirals as soon as possible. That's what my understanding will be. Right, Dr. Prati? Most likely. Yeah, I highlight this in the next session. Uh, Dr. Prati, can, can Zoster present as neuritis without any skin manifestation? Is it possible? Like transverse myelitis you're talking about. But uh, how about just plain neuritis without any skin manifestation? Uh... I haven't seen much. Uh, I don't think so. Probably, uh, maybe uh, neurologists can enlighten uh, us on that. Without rash, uh, I, I'm not aware about that. Uh, Rukmini, ma'am, or Shankar, sir, neuritis without rash. Yeah, you can have neuritis without rash. I mean, and the other thing is that the rash can disappear quite well in advance, and you may have a neuritis. The shingles need not be continuous and it may be a very small area. So sometimes it may be missed. Yes. So if you have a typical dermatomal distribution of neuralgic pain, it may be related to post-herpetic neuralgia. So that's there. It's difficult to diagnose, it, diagnose it at that time because uh, you don't expect to find any, uh, I mean, uh, evidence of active infection at that point. But basically, any neurologic pain which is in a dermatomal fashion, the treatment options are the same. So we go ahead with the same treatment. Shankar, sir. Uh, this uh, pain without a herpetic rash, uh, that condition is known as Joster sign herpete. Uh, Joster sign herpete. Also, I have not seen, but uh, we have. We have to suspect a few of the conditions, like when the patient presents with, uh, just like uh, Dr. Rukmini told, uh, transverse myelitis or uh, Wollenbari syndrome, GBS, uh, this is stroke syndromes, and uh, uh, peripheral motor neuropathy. If the pure uh, motor neuropathy, there we have to, even motor neuropathy, not sensory, but uh, there also it is one of the complicated uh, herpes zoster where sometimes we may not see the herpetic lesions, herpetic rash. Uh, the management of uh, herpetic neuralgia is on the lines of neuropathic pain. Uh, we have uh, earlier we discussed regarding diabetic uh, uh, neuropathy. So in the same lines, uh, we had to treat uh, this uh, uh, herpetic neuralgia with uh, gabapentinoids and uh, tricyclics and SNRIs and uh, so opioids and uh, the topical treatment with the capsaicin and uh, lidocaine patches. So the same line of treatment, almost uh, same. 
Thank you so much, sir. Uh, it's 9.01. If nobody has any other questions or comments, uh, we would start winding up the session. Pranit, your closing comments? Yeah, so uh, fairly common uh, infection uh, that we see. Uh, most commonly prevalent in uh, immunocompromised individuals, but uh, some of the immunocompetent persons also can develop uh, uh, this infection. Uh, we know the phases, it goes through uh, vesicular rash followed by uh, scarring. Uh, early treatment helps prevent uh, the damage to the nerves and thereby prevent the uh, so-called troublesome complication that is the post-herpetic neuralgia, which can be disabling in terms of pain. So early recognition, early treatment uh, with acyclovir and val acyclovir, uh, advantage being uh, lesser frequency in comparison to the traditional acyclovir, 800 mg three times a day for five to seven days. Uh, to prevent uh, vaccinations do play a role, but the availability and cost are limitations. Uh, hopefully in the future with increasing awareness and uh, probably availability, the cost should come down and hopefully we should prevent uh, the vaccination. Once neuralgia develops, maybe in conjunction with uh, a neurologist, we should probably help the patient in managing neuralgia. I think awareness is the key, early recognition and early treatment is the key and uh, uh, consultation with a dermatologist and an infectious disease specialist will help treat uh, herpes zoster effectively and thereby prevent the complications of the zoster. Thank you, Anup. Thank you, Praneet. One thing that I uh, that I will add, which uh, what uh, Somaraju sir also mentioned, I think we take it as a joke, but uh, it is a reality. I think enough patients have gone through angiogram for chest pain evaluation who actually had uh, uh, herpetic uh, pain. In this particular index case also, as I was mentioning that this patient had angioplasty about six months ago. So when he messaged me about uh, chest pain, the first thought that came to my mind is uh, angina only. So that is why I rushed him to my clinic to see um, if there is any other problem. And uh, thankfully, uh, this, came to, uh, this came to my attention and uh, I did not subject him for any further investigation. But this is real, it happens. It is uh, more of a learning for cardiologists, but I'm pretty, but I'm almost certain it is true for all the healthcare providers as well. That uh, if some patient has chest pain, then before we subject them for angiogram, it is worth at least taking a look at their chest to make sure there is uh, there is no rash or there is no any other problem. Uh, mastitis and herpes they are uh, they are notorious uh, to actually lead patients to angiogram where a simple diagnosis could have been made otherwise. So uh, with this, I'll close the session. Uh, thank you, Pratik sir, for joining today. And uh, I thank uh, all of you. Thank you, Rukmini madam and Shankar sir for your opinion. Uh, Somaraju sir, who had always been uh, uh, in these sessions since last more than one year now. Uh, so thank you all for being here. We'll see you again next Wednesday with a new topic. Take care and good night. Thank you. Good night.